Okay. Welcome, everyone. So the last Triple M for the year, 2023. Um, the topic of presentation for this Triple M is transparency in Australian politics. Um, but if there is a topic that you'd really like to introduce in the next Triple M meeting, please um, pitch for that topic at our Triple M pitch form, which I'll get to in a sec. But thank you. Just the agenda that we'll go through, we'll have the Secretary's report on members' numbers, Treasurer's report on financial statements, the Executive report on what the Exec's been up to, Committee reports, so that's policy, comms and um, engagement, and then transparency in OSPOL before just general chatter. Great. Uh, Owen, I see you're here. Would you like to speak to the members? Hi team. Um, yeah, we lost uh, a few members this last month, unfortunately. Um, I guess enough to stay registered though. Uh, that's the main thing that matters. But... Good, good, good. Yeah, so, uh, and if you go to slash party underscore information on our Fusion website, you can see this dashboard of our members and, and finances as well. All right, anything else, Owen? Oh, that's all. Cool, cool. All right. Next, Mark. Um, and just, just quickly, if I, if, uh, am I, uh, my audio has been playing out recently. I think I'm coming through. Yeah, 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 yeah. cool. Um, just a quick question on the members. Um, I'll, I've seen some of the emails sort of in the in the groups, but uh, do we are we capturing or seeing if we can capture? Um, maybe just make a note to see if we are able to capture. Uh, request the reasons for for departures uh, when when possible. I think I've seen a few where mm -hmm. we sort of just process and thank them, but it might be good to see if we can get some additional feedback there. Yeah, also. for um for the ones I process, I always ask them what their reason is. But um, you know, I I guess it, it, it we is don't want to bother pretty... them too much, but but um, oh, if, I they, guess, yeah, we, if we, they, they want to be done with us, but it would be nice to be able to just collect that if possible. Hmm. Yeah, ideally, um, when we update the website in the future, hopefully we can um, include like a form, you know, when they could cancel, I guess, you know, they can go in the text box uh, where they can rant or <laughs> whatever they want to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's sure. a good suggestion. All right, great. Um, okay, so look to speed run the, the financials. So pretty standard month, uh, except for one item. So most of the 264 in donations, it's mostly recurring. Um, which is great, um, as always. And then expenses, we have most of the standard things. So bank fees is, is uh, transaction fees. Um, the IT services, um, based on some requests at the AGM, I'm, I'm in the process of sort of splitting accounts into things a bit more granular. So it's a bit easier to read these or when we, especially when we make them uh, just sort of available on the website, it'll be a bit easier to follow. Um, but uh, ID services and subscriptions is, is effectively just our uh, the emails, the Fusion Party emails, as and the accounting software we use. And then tools party administration of two hundred forty three is an ex extra item this month, which is the uh, the name is escaping me, but the the um the application that we've used to manage the voting system for the AGM. Uh, so that was um uh, sort of takes. Yep. Uh, it, yep. So that takes away a lot of that takes away a lot of work. Um, but um, yeah, there's a little bit of expense to that. So it's only a one year thing, but that's um, what we've done there. So uh, so that's that's where we yeah. So that, why we fall a bit. Um, if we if we didn't have that, we would have had a, a positive month. But um, yeah, we'll have those once offs every now and then. So yeah, 171 negative of, of, for that month. So the next slide is just the prof uh, the balance sheet, uh, which just has. Most things are finally reconciled now. There's one remaining uh, reimbursement that's been sitting for a while, not, not able to get hold of uh, the person um, for that. But um, our total uh, amount at the at sort of the end of the month is that three thousand three hundred eighty-four dollars and eighty-seven cents. So slowly building up the war chest again after the big nation builder payments. Um, and uh, there's a potentially a potential of a by-election coming up soon, so we'll want to be trying to uh, build up some funds so that we can uh, be ready for that when it comes up. So that's all for me. Cool. Thank you very much. Any questions on finances? Surprises? Opinions? Great. Okay. 
uh, executive report. So just a reminder that we have a fortnightly executive meeting, which is open to our members to observe. Our next meeting is actually tomorrow night at 7.30. Uh, just an update on the AGM that we had. So we had two meetings for the AGM, <clears throat> just this quirk of our constitution. We have certain quorum numbers and we, we never meet them. So we always have a supplementary one. Um, so we did that and we voted on proposed constitutional amendments. Uh, one was passed, version 1.5. Um, there is a vote currently happening on the new fusion executive candidates. So as Michael mentioned, the OPA vote that we're using, you would receive some emails, at least two by now, um, asking for your vote. Um, and that voting will finish very soon because we only have two weeks. So make sure you get your votes in because that will uh, compile the fusion executive going forward from the end of this year to 2024. And if you ever want to contact us, our email is at the bottom. I've just put a point about conduct your due diligence for the voting of the fusion exec candidates. And so what I mean by that is on the next slide, just a bit of a guidance uh, suggested questions to look into, because um, this is not something that we do formally, but always is good to do your due diligence when you're voting for the new exec. And yeah, I'll be posting these slides to our YouTube video as well. So no need to memorize or take screenshots here. Okay, so committee reports. Uh, for engagement, we have a Google events calendar, which we share on each of our monthly newsletters. And we also have a link to it on our slash events page. So if you want to keep up on what's happening on your own calendar app on your phone, please look at our events calendar. Um, <clears throat> we've been having meetings for state-based coordinators new volunteer inductions and candidate information sessions. Um, Miles, since you're here, are there any of these meetings coming up? Yeah, so the next candidate information session will be in uh, early next year in February, mm -hmm. and we'll have monthly volunteer inductions each month as well. Uh, there's also a, a new... Uh, a new workshop which we've just started discussing as of the last few days, which we'll probably jump in the mix as well, which will be some um, uh, policy dev related uh, trainings. I'm hoping we can uh, put those together and kick those off. And um, that's related to Michael's uh, um, updates to the policy dev moving forward. Very nice. Thank you very much. And um, we don't have Angus on. All right. So, we have a monthly newsletter, so that usually comes out by the end of the month. If there's any uh, articles or interest topics that you'd like to write a blog post on that we put onto our Fusion website, uh, please send us an email to comms at fusion, fusionparty.org.au. Uh, and then here we also have a link to pitch future Triple M topics for these meetings. Policy. Cool. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> so me again. Uh, so in the last newsletter, we sent out a uh, sort of a number of updates around some policy development. Um, this included some of the ongoing stuff, such as the the uh, housing policy, which is uh, which we're still getting through. Um, so there's lots of information in there to to look for. Um, there's also some things around some submissions and some other work streams. Uh, but the one I wanted to point out for the most part was, uh, as Miles said, we'll be looking at. Um, setting up some additional uh, work streams for policy and trying to onboard more people to be able to jump in and contribute. Uh, I'm, uh, the, the, there's a few different parts of this. So one is that, uh, as, as, as Miles said, we're looking to um, hopefully set up some some meetings shortly, some, some sessions shortly where we can do some kickoffs for various policies, which will include people being able to introduce topics that they are looking to lead as a work stream or that they have proposed. Uh, and then just sort of organizing the sort of how the what the processes will be for for moving that forward and 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 uh, getting that content written. So um, I was hoping that maybe we would look at uh, changing the so next next Wednesday we would be having the housing develop uh, the housing policy working meeting. Um, but I was looking we we, we may look at uh, make sort of opening up some time in there just for just for a general um, uh, a general meeting that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do some of that, and then we'll look to, to do that ongoing. 
but it might be that we need to wait a little while as we get other things set up for it. But the main thing, what, some of the things we'll be doing is getting a sort of a singular page up where uh, people can view all of the ongoing proposals and work streams and um, so, so people can track that much easier. Uh, and we also have set up a policy newsletter where we'll be able to send updates to that. So uh, if you have any uh, particular topics that you really want to work on or you'd like to contribute to, or um, would like to be involved in the processes or anything like that, um, please let us know at either via, via the policy intake form. Um, so that's just the website slash uh, policy intake, policy underscore intake as it's on the screen, um, or policy at fusionparty.org.au. So there's a few topics that have been raised so far that we're looking to get into, and these include uh, AI safety and industry, uh, education, so it's expanding some of the existing policy there, um, more uh, detailed policy around transport, there's a um, already pretty developed pro uh, pol uh, proposal from Angus on smoking and vaping laws. Uh, and there is some uh, interest around uh, nuclear energy and expanding some of that policy as well. So uh, again, let us know if you're able to contribute or if you'd like to and keep an eye out for those further updates. Great, thank you very much. There was a lot of info there. Anything that uh, piqued anyone's interest or if you'd like to ask a question before we move? Cool. Okay. So now it's the topic for the, the Triple M and it is 7.12. So we have raced through that and I don't think this will take all of the, the rest of the hour. But I, I wanted to speak about transparency. It's um it's an area of interest that's really important to me. And I think it's important to everyone, no matter which part of the political divide you're from. Um, we saw it at the federal election. Um, we've always... I mean, I've always felt like UAP has been a threat to fair democracy because we know it as a Trojan party for the Liberal vote. Um, but we saw this interesting outcome in the federal 22 election where people were so enraged by how the COVID pandemic was managed. People didn't feel like there was much transparency in how decisions were made and how things were managed that people just went the other way, overcorrected, and really wanted minimal government involved in uh, affecting their lives. And so people started to turn to the UAP and the anti-vax stance, which is fine. I don't really want to get into that debate. But the the thing with the moving towards UAP, uh, it just kind of means that it would win the citizens another liberal, um, another liberal vote, which is ironic because it was the Liberal Party that really mismanaged the uh, the COVID response. So, but the thing is, the thing that drew people to UAP was because they really felt that lack of transparency. Transparency is needed for trust. So why to care about transparency? We need to grow trust. Trust is important for ensuring success of government. So the lack of trust is seen as a measure of the willingness of citizens and business to respond to public policies and contribute to a sustainable economic recovery. So why trust is important in government and for politics and for political parties is if we don't have trust, we don't have that public goodwill that they will listen and uh, I guess cooperate and work with the political structures that we have in place. And, uh, yeah, that could really lead to, uh, I guess, dissolving of community and um, wasteful, um, a waste of resources. It's not very efficient to work that way. It's it's um, chaotic and it's dystopian. So, yeah, we don't want that. The loss of trust in government. Sorry, I, I have COVID right now, so I'm coughing like crazy. The loss of trust in government often comes when there's a loss of trust in the capacity of people to deliver services. And we see that quite a bit. That's pretty much what fueled the UAP um, movement. So for us to have adequate transparency, we need to have better support and protection of whistleblowers. So what we have as the whistleblower protection laws are um, referred to, they're, they're called the Public Interest Disclosures Act. So this is a federal act. 
and they're designed to encourage information disclosure so we have transparency. So if anyone's working in the public service um, or in uh, public universities and public education and they see something that's a bit dodgy and they think the public would really like to know about that because of that mismanagement of funds and um, just not being fair, really, we, um, oh, sorry. We want to protect them to be able to, to uh, disclose that. So um, from what I've heard, Australia doesn't have a dedicated, sorry guys, just give me a moment. Um, Sahar, when you're back, uh, I'm curious, you mentioned here one of the dot points, the no low cost legal assistance. Are you saying that's a good idea or that it already exists? I'm curious to know. Uh, thanks for that. I really, it's not good. Don't catch it. Anyway, <clears throat> I heard your I heard your question, Owen. Thank you. So from, from from what I've seen, Australia doesn't have a dedicated body to educate, empower, and protect whistleblowers. There's definite um, bodies that can provide that education, but we don't have a dedicated one. So we have the uh, Commonwealth Ombudsman, and I found the New South Wales Ombudsman very helpful. They provide a lot of information about the PID Act. Um, but what's really important is being able to offer no or low cost legal assistance. And the closest th thing that I've found is this one here. It might be good to do a shout out at this point for a few non-profit, uh, non-government organisations that support whistleblowers. Um, the um, Electronic Frontiers Australia is a really important body that does a lot of advocacy work across a wide range of areas, including whistleblowers. They're probably, uh, probably the most high profile advocacy body that um, supports whistleblowers alongside the, um, the, uh, law council of australia i think it's called the um peak industry body for lawyers the australian law council and uh human rights watch uh australia and along with its state branches as well um we pro probably also give a honorable mention to the australian civil liberties union too for some of the work they've done previously uh regarding uh, whistleblowers more generally there's probably a really important point to talk about uh Julian Assange, and although a lot of the civil rights bodies in Australia have supported Assange, none of them even come close in enthusiasm and activity as compared to the dedicated free Assange campaigns, of which there's a, um, a, a there's multiple sort of loosely affiliated groups, both nationally and at a state level. As um, supporting Julian Assange is is something that a lot of Australians are aware of and are and are fighting for his release. And um, a, a final point about whistleblowers as well is that uh, a Witness K and the David McBride trial has only just recently started as of the last uh, month in uh, in Canberra, and um, and that's been a much more immediate case of whistleblower prosecution by the Australian government, but one which has not got anywhere near as much coverage as the. Um, uh, as 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 Julian Assange, and not not to say that not not to kind of compare the two, but it is uh, a, a very clear example that even though Australia has for a long time sort of abandoned and forgotten Assange, it is definitely an ongoing thing, and new whistleblowers are continuously being punished. And David McBride's decision to enter a guilty plea is, I think, a, a very sort of sort of poignant or telling moment there, where um, where. You, you you enter a guilty plea if there's if you think there's no chance of actually winning in court and it's the best thing to do to sort of minimize the 
the, the the personal impact, and so that's um, extremely disappointing that that the legal system would be so strongly stacked against whistleblowers. And I believe it was the um, EFA put out a press release on the David McBride trial, specifically saying that I'm um, pointing out that this would have a very very um, uh, negative impact on any whistleblowers in future who want to come forward. And this really is a this really should be a cross-partisan issue as anyone who professes to be a classical liberal or adhere to classical liberalism should really be supporting uh, civil rights and civil liberties such as this, as well as uh, supporting the um, supporting the individual standing up against government and, and corporate tyranny. But um, it's very sad to see that the um, that the the Liberal National Party are almost as enthusiastic as the Australian Labor Party in prosecuting whistleblowers. Thanks for covering for me, Miles. Yes, very important points. And those are very notable um, examples of whistleblowers as well, which I will mention as well a bit later. Um, so Owen, you had a question? Oh yeah, I was just curious. Um, David McBride, can you guys remind us, sorry, what did he reveal? Who's this, David McBride? Yeah. So he was uh, exposing war crimes in Afghanistan, not related to um, Ben Roberts Smith. But the the tragedy with that is he doesn't have whistleblower protection because it's a national security disclosure. Um, but the thing is, it was a public interest disclosure at the time, and it's not a public interest to continue to prosecute him. And so people were arguing. Um, you know, we already proved that Ben Robert Smith is is a war criminal. Um, why are we still prosecuting this whistleblower of, you know, um, Afghanistan war crimes? So, yeah, it's pretty sad to see that happen. Okay, all right. There, there was a, a, a little point of nuance there as well, which is that the... Um the judge found that David McBride was not actually obliged to act in the public interest in the work he was doing in Afghanistan with the Australian Defence Forces. And so, therefore, um, he couldn't claim the defence that it was acting in the public interest, even though <laughs> it, it, it seems utterly ludicrous to think that releasing uh, whistleblowing is, is not... There are circumstances where it wouldn't be in the public interest here. Ludicrous. Yeah, it was pretty much anti-Nuremberg. Um, okay, and so I just wanted to reflect a little bit on the New South Wales ICAC. So the New South Wales ICAC model is seen as the, the most um, trustworthy model that we have so far. Unfortunately, the, um, the national, the federal ICAC is being modelled on the Victorian um, IBAC model, uh, which Swollen Pickles on YouTube did a good dissection of and, and has shown that it's not as strong, not as robust as the New South Wales ICAC model because the IBAC in Victoria allows um, private sessions, which is not really transparent, uh, as well as other, other things. But anyway, so with New South Wales ICAC, I was keen to learn from them how they want to prevent corruption and support integrity. So their framework, they focus on measures to prevent corruption. So they have um, really good, you know, defined requirements for what is corruption and, and ways you can try and prevent that happening. So it's, it's a lot about culture. It's a lot about um, empowering people to report and know who to report to. But then they also want to incentivize building integrity. So, you know, really encourage and reward people who um, disclose, even if it's dibber dobbing on your boss, um, the aim is integrity is the best for your organization, helps it to be more workable and more trustworthy. Um, the definition of corruption from the ICAC Act is deliberate or intentional wrongdoing, not negligence or a mistake, which means that, you know, you have to prove that they deliberately or intentionally want to do something wrong. So just being willfully incompetent is not bad. So this allows ineffective or incompetent organisations which not be classified as corrupt, not to be culpable or accountable for investigation. So I think um, a lot of 
organizations that I've had firsthand experience with have, uh, I mean, I'm not making a PID submission here, but um, it kind of allows there to be that um, complacency. So if you're not documenting how you do certain processes or if you don't have um, defined roles and who does what, then you're not really going to be accused of um, wrongdoing. It's more like negligence. So there's that risk there, that gray area. The reason why transparency and trust is important is because democracy thrives on having access to information to be better informed when we are called to make decisions and make votes. So democracy thrives when people can see, understand, and participate in the decisions that affect their lives. And when decision makers are accountable for their actions and when leaders lead with integrity. So we kind of have to know what are the responsibilities of our MPs? What are the responsibilities uh, and jurisdictions of our certain departments, federal, state, um, premier, prime minister? Democracy is a system of government in which power is vested in the people either directly or through elected representatives. And what we're seeing is our democracy is undermined by the vested interests of the donors behind the scenes. And there are a few tools available, which I'll um, mention later as well in the reference pages that I have of certain tools where you can go and have like a little bit of a choose your own adventure curiosity quest and see uh, which parties are accepting donations from which companies and which companies are donating to which parties. And that could paint a little bit of a picture for you. Like um, Westpac is a very big donor to both of the parties, top three. Um, and the Labor Party has also accepted donations from Airtasker and Uber, which I think is kind of funny considering they're a party that represents workers' rights. So democracy, it involves the participation of citizens in decision-making processes and provides for the protection of individual rights and liberties. And I think because we're really lacking transparency and there's a bit of um, obscurity when it comes to accessing the, the processes um, of decision-making um, in democracy. So, I mean, I guess like the parliamentary committees, not many people know that, like how you can even access the parliamentary committees. I mean, um, we have a small audience here, but who here feels comfortable knowing like how they can access their local MP or who to access or what they can access them for and what to expect from them? Like, what's the general confidence feeling here? Yeah, I, I agree with you. That, like, they, you could, I guess, find their personal website, send them an email, but um, I guess I, I'd be surprised if, you know, I actually hear back from the amendment themselves. It would typically be, um, you know, a staffer who gets back to me, what, within like three days. Yeah, I guess you're the normally as well sort of palming you off. Yeah, exactly. Anyone else relate to that? Any experiences like that emailing their MP? There is, I mean, there's generally a, um, it's generally noted that uh, a lot of, mo most representatives do pay attention to their contact forms and, and things like that. It's, it's um, and, and that sort of contact MPs can be effective. Um, but I think more about knowing about their decision-making processes and um, what, feedback they are what feedback they are getting how they're responding to it and um yeah i think generally people do feel relatively disillusioned or think that um nothing that they ask for or or, or criticize will will have a response yeah you just reminded me um when i was hanging outside the bruce lerman case i was speaking to a young guy he had an interesting looking camera started talking about politics and he says he um he, he was 23 and he votes one Labour, two Greens. And I was just like, oh, my God, had to school him on preferential voting. But the thing was, the thing that disheartened me the most was he said um, one of the, the major parties, Labour or Liberal, will win, will have to form government. And I said to him, that's a very defeatist way of looking at our democracy. It's, we, we shouldn't be feeling like we're reduced down to do 
to a duopoly. I said to him, next time you vote, vote for the parties with the policies you actually like and then put Labor second or third or fourth and then Liberal last, okay, however you do it. But the only thing that I've seen that actually impacts change in the major parties is any threat to their primary vote. I've heard of um, left-wing groups like the, the group Solidarity in Sydney um, have been saying, you know, suggesting speak to your union leaders if you want to have change in the Labor Party policies. But what's the guarantee that's, that that message is even going to the Labor Party or that they're listening? What Where's the feedback? So that's yeah. my, my take. Actually, Sahar, on that point, reminds me, um, I saw yesterday on Twitter these, um, what was it? There was this statement that Young Labor was, um, quote, unquote, standing in solidarity with the Greens, pressuring old Labor, I guess, for lack of a better word, pressuring old Labor to be more pro-Palestine. And, um, like, you know, this whole absurd situation that, you know, they can still be active members of the Labor Party, you know, demanding, oh, Labor has to respond to me. Like, it, you know, actions speak louder than words. If they're still going to be members of the Labor Party, then, you know, how seriously is the Labor Party going to take their threats? Um, and I guess, you know, it, it is a common narrative you know, write to your local MP, write to Labor, write to Liberal and ask them, you know, to change, you know, to have like universal basic income, for instance. But, um, you know, like th this story obviously works to keep Liberal and Labor in power forever. You know, we need, they're only ever going to change if they feel threatened, as you say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect example. And um, just if someone wants to watch the latest on this, Juice Media brought out a really good, uh, video on this duopoly and how they maintain it. I'll put that in the caption of our YouTube video after this as well. Okay. So Fusion's stance on ethical governance and transparent government is here. So this is on our website slash ethical underscore governance. So, you know, we were fighting for an anti-corruption body, whistleblower protection, so stronger PID Act. So the latest PID Act actually came in October last year. So there has been an improvement on that. Uh, and just to fight for transparent government and campaign finance reform. So there are people asking for real-time disclosures of political donations, having a cap on donations, because as, as we are functioning at the moment, um, I was able to raise close to five grand for my campaign in 2022, which I was very um, grateful for and very surprised that I could even raise that much. But that's nothing compared to the funds that the major parties have. So, and while we don't want to reduce effectiveness to the dollar, um, considering how disengaged most people are, um, we really, you do need that cash to be able to effectively campaign and advertise just so people even know Fusion exists before they reach the, the ballots. Uh, the ballot box so yeah it, it really does impact equality and fairness in our democracy if some people are better able to get their voice out over others i'm just curious for some of the people that are in the in the meeting um how long have you been part of fusion how did you first hear about us You can use the chat if you're shy as well. <laughs> yep. Well, okay, that's fine. I'll just move on. Cool. Uh, so part of the donation reform is having a cap on campaign spending. So currently there is a cap on campaign spending if you run an election in New South Wales, the ACT or Queensland, so the state-based elections. Um, there are the uh, suggestion of a cap on donations, $2,000 uh, from the Centre for Corporate Public, Aff Public Affairs um, and the need for real-time disclosures. These are requirements for donation reform. Um, oh, Sahar, just quickly on this, um, th these are your suggestions, aren't they, as opposed to, um, I guess, official fusion policy? No, no. So real-time disclosures is a current fusion um, policy. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I agree, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and cap on campaign spending. So this is something that, well, yeah, all of these are part of fusion policy. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay, sure. I'll have to read more about that. But it's just, um, I guess, yeah, it doesn't strike me as necessarily a good idea because I guess, um, you know, if a new party comes along, they're the ones who most need to spend money. Um, and so, you know, if we need to spend all this money getting the word out, I guess, look at how can we justify the cap? I guess um, maybe if you're looking from, at it from the perspective of like, um, Liberal and Labor have lots of members, they would logically get more donations and that gives them, you know, an unfair advantage. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think it's obviously a good idea to impose a cap. Yeah, I think at the moment the way people see it is you're free to raise as much money as you like. So at least if we put a cap, then that um, evens the playing field and, and is less of a motivation for lobby groups to be sleeping in the pockets of our MPs, you know. There's no, uh, there's no reason why a new party would be able to spend more than that a legacy party. The amount of inertia that Labor and Liberals have in, in terms of uh, political inertia means that they attract the vast majority of donations. So unless a new party was able to start up, which is able to donate more than, you know, the hundreds of thousands that the parties get currently, then there's, it, 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 it wouldn't happen and it never has happened. Oh, but I thought with Clive Palmer and, um, you know, Climate 200, I thought they were getting massive donations. Mm, Clive, Clive Palmer is a, a billionaire vanity project. Every other single billionaire in Australia donates to Labor or Liberals, um, Climate 200 is uh, not a party, first of all. Secondly, they don't actually take centralised donations. They coordinate between all of the different individual movements. So donators are channeled towards those rather than any one sort of central single party. So unleashing the donation caps wouldn't do much for them. Um Similarly, sort of adding in donation caps that they're not actually getting huge amounts of money. The reason why the Teal Independents did well is because they have really effective campaign management, and uh, which which works on a grassroots organising basis, and that does far more for their success than than money ever does. It would be really good to be able to pay our campaign managers and campaign organisers as well. We're we're running just on the smell of an oily rag <laughs> so yeah, that's it <laughs> so this is just a visual framework of how um i see trust integrity accountability transparency all working together so this is just for interest's sake it's not really to prove anything but um and i've just made a bit of a list of accountability corruptive factors and transparency corruptive factors so this is more like a checklist that if you're in an organization and you're seeing secrecy and collusion, you're seeing poor data quality, um, you're seeing lack of consistency and gatekeeping and things like that. These are all things that undermine um, your transparency, your ability to be accountable, which then impacts your integrity and then impacts your trust. So just a curiosity to look at in your own time. Some notable notable events on to uh, cover were, so currently we have a COVID-19 inquiry on the response and recovery. I have a link here for the um, terms of reference. So, of course, COVID-19 was a huge triggering event for a lot of people for many reasons, and people weren't happy with how it was managed. Miles, do you have a question? Yeah, so um, the Effective Altruism Movement is actually coordinating a series of workshops to write responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it'd be, uh, I, th I think it'd be good for us to uh, promote them as a rationalist movement, which aligns pretty closely to uh, a lot of the values and, uh, and, and ideas discussed in Fusion. Uh, I'm just trying to find the dates. I think it's happening... Um, there's there's a bunch all around Australia happening at the moment, but um, I know there's one in in Canberra, there's one in Brisbane, there'll be one in uh, Melbourne as well. 
Cool. Very good shout out. Awesome. All right. Other notable events. So this one might not have been um, too, this was a bit under the radar, but we had Richard Boyle and the ATO. So whistleblowing on the ATO and that's what led to all those, um, what came out about PwC and all those um, questionable contracts. So there's an article about him. So just to, to remind people though, whistleblowing happens when it's public interest. So if you're working in the public service, public university so not necessarily um, if you're working in a private company but if that private company has an impact on the environment so if it's a public interest for example for the environmental protection agency you can do a disclosure there but you'll notice that a lot of these are public interest disclosures there from they they're what impact or are from the public service wikileaks yep infamous Julian Assange an Australian uh, he's just has not had a break um, so he was indicted on 18 counts of violating the Espionage Act for hacking the government computers how cool is that um, and yeah and published a whole bunch of classified secret military diplomatic documents between 2010 and 2011 um, so we have a link here action.assangecampaign.org.au so that's one that's happening and active in Australia right now. Uh, highly recommend you sign up to that to support him. Uh, do you have another question? Miles? No, sorry, I forgot no. to load my hand. It's all right. <laughs> cool. Other ones, so Troy Stoles. So he um, is terminally ill right now, uh, dying of cancer, but he's been busy exposing clubs in New South Wales because they've been involved in failing to comply with anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing rules. So Friendly Geordies and About a Boy, I think, or who was it? The other YouTuber. They um, had this thing where they were like going to the pokies and they were being as blatant as possible that they were laundering money because that's, that's a way that people launder money. They take in questionable money, put it through the pokies, and then, um, you know, request the money to come out and that that legitimizes the money. So there's an example of money laundering there. Uh, David McBride, yep. So he was um, revealing about the war crimes that were happening in Afghanistan, but just, yeah, recently he pleaded guilty, which was very sad to see, but he looks very confident. So fingers crossed. I think he's going to have to go to jail for the rest of his life for that. So it's pretty bad. And then this is not one that people have called being a whistleblower, but since I've been observing the Bruce Lerman defamation case, Brittany Higgins, you could say is a whistleblower because she, you know, allegedly was raped at Parliament House. Um, she went through the processes to, you know, report it, um, but obviously they didn't manage it well internally. Um, so she whistle blew on Parliament House and their practices when it comes to work, health and safety. And so she recently was successful in a settlement with the common, Commonwealth government because, oh, sorry. Oh, um, hey, Sahar, when you when you've recovered, I'm curious to know, actually, um, I think you mentioned you're actually going to the trial for, for um, Brick Higgins, um, Bruce Lemon. I, I wonder um, what your thoughts are on, um, I'm very suspicious about, you know, Bruce Lemon's power and influence. Um, I mean, in the case now, for instance, you know, someone has pointed out that he has, what, like four barristers? And even apparently billionaires don't bring along four barristers to a trial. And, you know, it was revealed that, you know, Channel 7 is paying his rent. Um, and, you know, he, he, was on, he was working on top secret projects, even, you know, as a young graduate. And many people are asking, like, how come, how can we shut up the ranks so quickly? And where's all this money coming from? And yeah. Yeah, very good questions. I, I think it's been a very interesting case to watch for many reasons. Um, but just to finish what I was saying, um, so Brittany Higgins was successful in reaching a settlement with Commonwealth government for about $2 million uh, because they admit um, they had a duty of care, which they uh, didn't uphold. But to your questions, Owen, it's been very interesting going to the courtrooms and seeing Bruce Lerman in the flesh. It just really, um, 
it's weird because he's been used as such a political symbol, a bit of a uh, cultural tool. And then just to see him, he's just a average person, you know. Um, but from what I've learned, he started in Parliament House as an 18-year-old, so he was volunteering and he just worked up the ranks, so I think he's 28 now. Um, but I don't think he's the most... Um, uh, so one of the, the testimonies today was about how when she one witness had met him on that fateful night at the dock, um, he had said to them that he just applied for a job at ACES and she was just saying that that's the stupidest thing anyone could do. If you're applying for a job at ASIO or ACES, you're not going around telling people that. So, I thought they explicitly tell you to keep this a secret. <laughs> yeah. So maybe he was lying. Maybe he just has no idea. I don't know. But um, I'm listening to the case as objectively as possible. Um, and um, I haven't come... I don't think, I, I, I'm not going to make my own decision. I'm going to wait to see what the judge says. But I think it's really interesting seeing what this case is doing because um, so at the moment he's suing Channel 10 because of the story on the project, but he's quite backed by Channel 7. And I would speculate to say that Channel 7 is paying for his lawyers. Um, and, I mean, Channel 7 was backing Ben Roberts. That was, that was well, proof, so. wasn't it? That Channel 7 was uh, paying for his legal costs? They're, they're oh, paying for his apartment. Uh, was it proven that they're also paying for his legal costs? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's right, the apartment. But the apartment was such a ridiculously high price. It's like, why? I think it's a three-bedroom apartment in the Northern Beaches for $2,500 a week is what Channel 7 is paying for for a year. Pretty good. But, yeah. That's the... Um, that's, that's the way that uh, people like him get treated. They fail upwards. Yeah, definitely. Have you been, anyone else been following it and have any hot takes? He, um, he's from Queensland. He's from uh, Toowoomba, I believe. He, um, if you get to know that there's, uh, if you, if you get to know young liberals through, usually they come up through, through university or simply go straight into, um, working in staffers' offices, it's very much a kind of dynastic thing where family connections or school connections are um, far more important than actually any kind of merit or even necessarily political alignment because the Liberal Party doesn't have politics. They're just a, a, a shell. And um, and so all kinds of really nasty people can, can very easily sort of fit in there. But a, a lot of people in the Liberals, I mean, sure, there's, there's outright malicious people, but um, I'd, I'd say of individuals I've met, it's more in a case of just boring corruption and incompetence and the um, small number of reasonable, motivated, and uh, and I would potentially even call them altruistic people. They're very, very rare in, in the Liberal Party. And um, you, can, you can really see this kind of culture of failing upwards in the, um, in, in, in young Liberals and in that sort of early, early career presence where this guy, Bruce Lerman has, has, has no qualifications. Like, do he, I don't know if he even graduated university and yet here he is uh, getting given this, these, these ridiculous um, the financial support. Itself, yeah. Oh, that too. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and this really cushy career. Yeah. I bet he's doing really well. And I don't see any redeeming qualities. How are you? earn to any of that so anyway but that's life <laughs> um, it shouldn't be yeah it shouldn't be <laughs> but um I've just got some slides here that are heavily populated with links so I mentioned some tools so a tool that me and a friend had worked on um called AEC insights it's all based on the data from the AEC transparency register so it's not real-time data, but it's the data that the parties submit for their annual returns and it shows, you know, where they receive donations from. So at the AEC Insights link, you can go and have a search and see for each of the parties which were the highest um, donors and how much they were given and, and things like that. But 
Another tool that I'd highly recommend is political gadgets. So have a play with that. I think that one's really interesting just to, to um, you know, follow your own curiosity. If there are certain companies that you want to know if they've donated to your favourite political party, you can look at political gadgets. And there's heaps of other things. They have like this, um, what's his name? Um, who's the alcoholic deputy prime minister? Um, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Barnaby Joyce. Joyce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking at the site now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they have like a Barnaby meter so you can um, see how different MPs vote, like how they're comparable. Um, another one to shout out is Right to Know. So they were great. They were like the first people that I had ever heard of who were sharing things openly. So they share things like freedom of information requests and the the replies that come from them. The replies aren't really that useful, but it's really good that there's a database that's keeping track of this stuff. And, and I want and would like to see more of that happening. The Hansard. So the Hansard is the official like minutes of what happens in Parliament. So if you really want to look up um, anything that Albo has ever said, you can look in the Hansard. And then this one, if you have time between nine and five during the weekdays, um, watch, read, listen is a good way to watch the Senate inquiries and the, the budget estimates and things like that. Um, let's see. So just a few transparency advocates here, Centre for Public Integrity, Transparency International. So they have a rating system. Um, Australia, I think, is ranked number 14 at the moment in the world. And the Australia Institute, they're great. They also have a democracy and accountability research wing. And then on YouTube, we've got uh, a few videos if you wanted to just learn the basics. So a few definitions and some podcast episodes that um, I listened to and I thought were pretty interesting. Uh, reports and studies and a tool here, Transparency Portal. So the Transparency Portal is a government website. So, but even Predovic, so he's the guy behind political gadgets, he was just saying that if one thing the government could improve on is to avoid using PDF files, because it's really hard to extract data when you're dealing with PDFs. And that's it for it, me. Is it? That's a, that's a really interesting point. Is that guy, <laughs> what's that guy's background? Who said that? No, I, I agree with him. I, I've tried to read PDFs for our Hawaiian menus, and yeah, there's lots of uh, quirks. It's, uh, if well, if it's if it's just raw text, it's fairly easy to extract the text, the data from that. But if it's a image based PDF, which is fairly common for, um, as a very fast and easy way to digitize physical documents, I can understand that would be quite difficult. That would be more difficult. Um, there should be. Like I, I can think of ways which this should be very easy and straightforward. So for example, you can have um, optical character recognition automatically run over image-based PDFs, which will then turn that image into raw text and it will strip out the, the formatting and the letterheads and the, and the fun stuff like that. Um, and it, it, but like that, that is utterly superfluous and there shouldn't be any issue. Um, OCR can introduce small inaccuracies but I think as a convenience function, it's um, it's it's a tool which can be quite good, especially when it's augmented by AI. Miles, this adds so much overhead, though. What does? Like you know, if they just provided it like as a web page, for instance, or just raw text, like, mm. you know, PDF is undeniably more hassle. Yeah, yeah, sure. But but I'm saying like if for uh, for physical copies of, um, of of reports and data and information like like literally printed out pages or written pages then you you'd want to digitize that and so um i can understand where you can take you take shortcuts in that digitization process which would um make it still a little bit more difficult to go through large amounts of documents yeah i, I guess ai would really help with all of that. <laughs> and hopefully we won't even need to depend on MPs when AI gets more sophisticated. <laughs> all right, so that was the end of the transparency topic. Just there's a lot to, to go into, but I just thought I'd keep it a brief introduction, I guess. And what's 
the most prominent um, examples of whistleblowing at the moment. Um, our next Triple M meeting is Wednesday, 7th of January. And if you'd like to pitch a topic or um, even submit an article for our newsletter, please email at comms at fusionparty.org.au and there's a link to our pitch form here. I'll uh, put a link to these slides on our YouTube video so you can access all of these links. And that's it. Oh, we made it with four minutes to spare, so. <laughs> Well, thanks so much. It was fascinating learning about this stuff, yeah. No worries. Thanks, thanks for soldiering through while sick. Oh, yeah, I know. That's <laughs> okay. Hope you feel okay. better soon. Thank you. So, um, all right, if no other chat, then I guess you have a PDC meeting now? Uh, no, there's no meeting this afternoon. It's uh, next one's next oh, week. Okay, sorry, I got that wrong. Okay. So next Wednesday. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, Thanks guys. So.